Game for draft now. Invictus Gaming on the blue side. Snake hitting over on the red. Zareth Trundle, the two bands there. That was another thing they didn't do was take out Flandre's Trundle. Cassiopeia said one of the answers for Snake, interestingly enough. And Malkai banned once again. So this time a champion like Hecarim does make it through the picks and bands. The top lane uh, champion board has been hit, but it's mostly been kind of these off-meta picks. I mean, Lulu not necessarily off-meta, but the likes of Trundle and Malkai to some degree have fallen in and out of the meta. They're more safe options, but now suddenly, Teleport Smite. Whichever one you want, ready to go. Yeah, we've got Lulu, the last band there for Snake, and you can see Zatai matching the random button pretty hard. They're all in his champion board, I was going to say, worry. scary to think that everything he's doing despite matching that button, he'll happily play. He's played just about every champion in the mid lane, and we'll give him 10 seconds to decide what he wants to take away for his team, but Zatai, always a crowd pleaser. Once always have some fun, but they do pick away the Gragas. This time there's no Sejuani, so you're going to have to go something a little bit different if you want to get engaged from the jungle. But you can see from the Jana Hover that it's all disengaged all the time, at least in this first round of picks, you'd think. I mean, Gragas still undefeated for Kakao, I believe, could make it 7-0 with a win here for Invictus Gaming. So a strong first pick away. Gragas been very good on 5.6 and now 5.7 as he moved over. But Azir, he's locked in already. Buck of Oriana was just fine, but Azir, Jana, straight back to basics for Snake. I don't Honestly, he's been so on point with his use of the explosive cast for displacement that you feel that even someone like Azir could be preyed upon when his flash is down. One thing to put out the Emperor's Divide and flash away. When the flash is not available, there are ways to deal with that. Kassadin's now available in the champion board. That's probably going to be the opt-in, you'd have to think, given just the success on Kassadin earlier. A lot of champions available, though, and no rush to lock in a mid laner just yet. No, not at all. Plenty of opportunity for Invictus Gaming, although they have good information right now IG going to potter through a couple picks here. We haven't seen this quite yet, actually, but it was a popular bottom lane for Kid and Kitties for a while. The Kennan's locked in. Kalista joins it, and that should be their duo lane. Just so much lane presence between these two. Kennan already been one of the strongest laners of all time, even with some slight nerfs. He was always a very strong laner, whether it was auto attacks, whether it's just the Shuriken Rush or Shuriken Toss or whatever she's able to use. Her whole kit, his whole kit, sorry, is very aggressive. And then with the Fates call for reposition, it's probably going to be disengaged rated cannon, but with Janna, of course, being locked in, you can't really look to lightning rush into the back line and get the CC going. But when it comes to disengage, plenty of options here for Ken. Yeah, Snake have started well here as we see what they want to pick up for the next few picks. Callista's been a favorite of Crystals, actually, for quite a long time here. But Snake, I like what they're doing here. Rek'Sai over to Beast, which makes sense. A bit more proactive, bit more engage options. But Crystal will take Tristana into the Callista matchup. And this is a very savvy take, is that people are starting to un cover that when it comes to auto attack trades, Ren sets are lovely, but dying instantly to the explosive charge coming through from Tristana is the reality. You cannot take auto attack trades with Tristana if you're on even on even foot or worse here. I mean, Tristana is just going to be able to do it just fine. So this is going to be interesting to see if we see the lane swap. I mean, the support in this case might make the difference in that you're taking auto attacks from a Cannon and a Callista. Much more aggressive trading coming through from the IG lane. But 2v2, you have to say, just on paper, Tristana should actually have the run of this bottom lane. Yeah, seems good there for Crystal. We know what he's like when his aggression is enabled, but IG picks some very late game carries. There's the last few, Hecarim and Kassadin. And the one thing here is that Kakao, he's got a lot of work to do because that is arguably three losing on neutral lanes. And that's not going to be ideal whatsoever. Their wave clear is also situational at best. Not wonderful, not abysmal, but somewhere in the middle between those two things. Cal going to help that with, of course, the barrel toss. Cal's playing the Gragas, so he's giving himself the best opportunity to get towards 7-0, but this is a difficult game, and we're going to see Beast onto the Rek'Sai we didn't actually mention. Going to have much more of a mid-game focus. Cal's already shown the virtues of how strong that champion can be. Looks like they're considering Nautilus, though. I mean, Flandre definitely does some stuff here, but we'll see what Snake want to pick away. Apparently, it is Nautilus, so that's what they'll take for themselves. And that is top lane Nautilus for Flandre. I think that is the definition of some stuff, the top lane Nautilus. Build path is always interesting. Rod of Ages has kind of been the standard, although then you're erring towards the late game, and then Hecarim will walk in and have Trinity Force. So maybe you're going to go for a bit more immediate power, like a Frozen Heart or something against this lineup. But top lane Nautilus. Flandre has been, if nothing else, the innovator this season with the Teleport Smite meta that Zatai is proudly wearing a Flandre special. But this is definitely something this different. This is very deep, pun intended there, with the Nautilus pickup in the top side for Flandre. I 
guess they just want a lot of CC. Because remember, Cassidy, when he gets going, he's hard to stop. Flandre is making sure he can stop the Cassidy. And there's a lot of question marks here. Zatai, probably happy to opt into a lane swap because he has the teleport, sm t teleport smite and can happily pick up camps. But can you imagine the jungle follows CC coming through from a Nautilus of all things? All the lanes, the moment Nautilus goes off the map, have to pay attention, whether it's support Nautilus or jungle Nautilus, because he has four types of CC. From level two onwards, can have access to three CCs, including the big, of course, dredge line hook. So it's going to be the battle of who can get the most done with the least amount of information, because there could be crazy three four-man fights in the mid lane early this game, if the jungle follow comes through. And don't forget as well that Nautilus was developed as a pick, effectively as a Callista counter pick. So Kid is going to have quite a lot of problems here, given the amount of gauge, especially coming through from the top lane. I mean, we said that Snake needs to be a bit more proactive, need more, you know, go buttons, need more engage tools. Flandre has found his own way to bring that to him. You know what? We'll see what Nautilus gets on the top side as we're about to get straight into game four. And welcome onto the Rift here for our fourth game as Snake, all grouped together nice and friendly around the big huggable Nautilus in the top lane for Flandre. Yes, don't adjust your volume or your television. That is exactly what's happening in this game number four. Yeah, you wouldn't think on patch 5.7 full zoom was really justified for a Nautilus, but it's a top lane Nautilus. It's not the support. It's not the jungle that honestly seems like rarer, rarest of all the breeds of Nautilus because the top lane Nautilus, apparently it's coming back. Yeah, Trinket Ward goes down though. Snake with a good five man able Oop. to clear out a bit of vision and they're looking for aggressive vision here. And they're going to again try and scale out that lane swap because level one going to get crazy here with all, this comp all these compositions. It's just really hard to say who's most priced in for a lane swap. There's always teams that benefit more than more from lane swaps, some that struggle in them. In terms of 2v2 lanes, it's probably going to be fine for Tristana, but maybe worth dodging the Callista Cannon in the early levels before you get access to all three abilities, specifically the Rocket Jump, if you're going to start with the Explosive Shot first. There's a lot of different flexible options coming through for IG, because as we mentioned, the jungle follow from Snake is very strong, but Hecarim being able to exit lane with Smite is also an advantage. Definitely a lot of trade-offs, so I'm just really excited to see what comes of all this action. Well, right now it seems like Invictus Gaming going to take away the blue buff here. Trying to spot where Snake's duel is. They're actually in the top side of the map, so if they're looking for the 2v2, they're not going to get it. Initiate the lane swap, I think, expecting IG to be there, but IG have already started on the other side of the map. So if we do eventually end up with this lane swap, the big thing for IG is that Hecarim isn't accountable. He's out able to get Smite, unless, of course, we see very fast lane pushing coming from Crystal and Ella, which is a possibility. But for now, on paper, it looks like they'll be able to pick up a lot of minions and the jungle follow. The uncleansable... Uh, tunneling engage coming through from the unburrow on beast and just flandre working towards level two and having cc you have to be so scared in the mid lane if you're a rookie and even though he's already won this laning matchup in game two today it's a very different proposition when both rexai and nautilus are tending towards your lane and look if ella wants to leave as well and come out a bit of additional cc and an exhaust could see you know four people in the mid lane at four minutes it became almost a running joke in the lpl regular season but we've seen a lot of teams opt into it in lane swap situations and Rookie certainly going to have to be on the back foot. The melee Cassidy with a flash only at level 1 to 3. Going to be pretty good target for that sort of gank. Absolutely. There's so many options here for Snake. The Rookie, who was actually even and maybe even a couple CS ahead in this matchup when he played it in game 2. But there was nowhere near this amount of pressure. Can't remember if it was standard lanes or a jungle follow. But still, it paled in comparison to what Snake have fielded. We talked about multiple losing lanes. Okay, now suddenly the 2v2 is not a losing lane, but the mid lane has so much extra pressure, but you can't help but expect Rookie to fall behind in CS or just fall prey to a gank. And I guess the other thing is who benefits most from the lane swap from these AD carries? Both Callista and Tristana quite happy to get additional farm here, but I'm not too sure who would rather have that early game edge and push towards your first early AD item. I feel like if you're looking for trades, I feel like Crystal will use that early AD pickup better than Tristana just because... Sorry, better than Callista, just because Callista's building Bloodthirst almost from necessity for safe laning phase, whereas you trade very effectively offensively with AD scaling on the Tristana. So probably you can see a lot more aggression from the early purchase, and thus Crystal maybe slightly getting the benefit from the lane swap. We'll have to see. So we are still in a pause in this particular game, but 
Curious to see what happens in the level one, of course. Movement always crucial in these sort of games. I mean, Cannon, not even too bad in a room, but does probably want to stick with the Callista. That's sort of the burden, I guess, of Fate's Call, is that as a support, you kind of expect it to be close to your AD carry. And if you're looking for any sort of CC, you need at least two levels, but that requires a very overextended meta member and multiple auto attacks, but three levels to have any realistic hope of picking up any room CC. So not really looking to lane, and honestly, such a strong laner, that it's always looking to opt into a 2v2, in this case, dodged by Snake. See, Flandre looks pretty happy right now, honestly, playing his Nautilus. So, again, Snake have often been innovators on different patches. We've noted that with Flandre with the Smite Teleport. Nunu was something that Beast almost brought back into the matter, it felt like, that now is stock standard across the top teams in the LPL. There's a reason Snake have done so well for effectively an amateur team on their first outing in a professional league, and they're always a lot of fun to watch, and Flandre especially is always entertaining as we pop ourselves back into the game. I mean, look, even if... Heck, uh, Nautilus eventually gets into a 1v2 situation. Obviously, going to be super tanky between the Titan's Wrath shield and just this naturally high health pool. So it's going to be fairly immovable in lane. Can last hit well with the Staggering Blow passive, applying CC and a bit of extra magic damage. But the jungle follow, that's the big question mark. So when we see level two on both, every lane, be scared. Yeah, you can see Ella actually pulling the blue away. So Snake going to take the other camp that belongs to them in this game, which is, of course, the Invictus Gaming blue buff as we're jungling vertically instead of horizontally this time around. But no gank coming quite yet. In fact, Baka holding his own in that lane right now on the Azir, kind of taking the early advantages that you expect in the range versus melee matchup. And again, you have to remember the Rookie cannot hope to overextend. There's so many different ways he can be ganked in the mid lane. We've already seen some of the creative things that Kakao could do when he was playing uh, the Rek'Sai with those burrowing over the thicker walls. But speaking of Kakao, He's prepped the extra jungler. That's the, the, the early dragon. That's what you get when you're jungling on the bottom side of the map. And as expected, they should pick it up very early. This is a hallmark of IG's play. In their uh, semifinals, actually, against EDG, they constantly took early dragons. Kakao loved to take it away at three to five minutes. And unfortunately for IG in that series, it did not convert them into wins. But you can say one thing about Kakao. He's been very consistent with early dragon control this whole series, actually. He just has a very good understanding of vertical jungler. That's what's open to them. Some teams, they kind of dilly-dally with picking up that early dragon. They might leave it to five, six, seven minutes into the game, but the time are going to be super early in this case. Pre-10 minutes, potentially, a second dragon could be down for IG. And the, again, we've talked about Dragon Snowball in particular in this series. Invictus Gaming have certainly been on top of it for the first two, and Snake kept it even, and that was enough for them as they forced a few team fights. So if IG can continue again this very objective-based, rotation-oriented style that they seem to have shown in the playoffs, They'll be on good stead to finally take the series 3-1. I'm quite surprised to see Crystal not looking to push out this top wave just because, as we discussed, Zatai's just able to jungle. And they've got two smites. They're going to pick up more camps than the enemy. That's just going to be the result, given how they're jungling. You can see Rek'Sai on the map tending towards the bottom lane and a potential mini, but it doesn't come through. But just surprising to see not trying to make Zatai a counter. Of course, if you push this top lane wave, Smite's not going to help you in lane like the old Ignite pickups used to. So it's less of a deterrent for a turret dive or anything like that. You'll be overextended with Smite Ignite in a large parts of the laning phase, but just happy to let this whole phase continue, and thus much more CS available for the Hecarim. Flandre now actually level two, a very easy target. Ella's coming down as well. The teleport, though, in for the type Beast. He's going to go in. Kitty's actually taking up the turret, but Beast will go down for first blood to Hecarim. Flandre trying to stun them up. We'll get the tie under the turret. A trade kill there goes to Ella, and a four-man dive goes a little wrong for IG. Yeah, much more benefit for Snake. They have two members picking up lane farm, so unless they get a big objective here, the fact that they use much less resources in this situation is a big benefit to Snake. And they're going to try and take the turret if they can, but Crystal, I think, pushing his wave out now is all actually no, going to meet it, wants to continue the freeze. And Tristana trying to buy a lot of time here for the top side, but Kid gets hooked up there by Flandre. Ella follows in for some harass, and IG might think better about going in for this turret. I'm just trying to unpack the, the benefits of this Nautilus. Of course, Nautilus not going to have a very high item cap. He's going to get tankier and tankier with purchases, but isn't looking for a Trinity Force or a big damage item as far as we know. He has fairly long cooldowns, but I guess with the changes to Riptide, you could consider it. It wouldn't be an ideal Trinity Force champion by any means. Probably just going to build stack tank items, just get the health scaling going with his Titan's Wrath shield, 
and just deal with his base values, which are very respectable. Certainly no rumble when it comes to early item power spikes, but always going to be relevant just because, again, has such a bevy of CC. Yeah, Beast are coming into the top side. Level 3 actually equal is the tie. Just going to take him off the wave. And Crystal's dedication to freezing almost got himself killed as Rookie diving into the mid lane. Gets ignited on Tabaka. Needs another Rift Walk. Does find it. And a solo kill for Cassidy. But getting outplayed on one of your trademark champions is really questionable from Baka. At least, uh, according to the portrait, had the ultimate available and not used. Not really sure what to make of that trade in the mid lane. Just a little too, a little sloppy there from Baka getting himself killed. But Kikau does the right thing in the top side as Kid and Kitties will get the turret in the bottom lane. Finally breaking that freeze from Crystal. He was really determined to deep freezing that wave, but it's finally been broken by the presence from the jungler and top laner. Yeah, but it's been answered in bottom lane. They've already pushed in a turret. Of course, no turret damage whatsoever coming onto Hecarim's turret. Hecarim's in general looking for a long laning phase, and okay, he has a very high um, item uh, item floor, you'd have to say, because he really wants Trinity Force, a Cinder Hulk, maybe some Home Guard boots to come through. Those are going to be significantly delayed, but IG are making them pay on the map, and they're going to start stacking dragons. The next one's only a couple of minutes out. I mean, thankfully for Snake, they are rotating their bottom lane down, so with the BF Sword Crystal, might feel a bit more comfortable in this matchup as Kid goes back. Berserker is just briefly, but double dagger recurve going for a quick hurricane, it looks like. Looking for team fights right now, you'd have to think there's going to be a point in this game where the likes of Nautilus and maybe even Rek'Sai will start to outscale the hurricane damage. The Rensets will be that much more difficult because Nautilus will be able to use his large amount of CC to isolate the cluster and ensure she can't spread the Rensets onto multiple members. But right now, it's a very big team fight in Power Spike. And crucially, if you can somehow find a way to swap back and fight with Dragon with those Rens Rensets available, with the hurricane being able to push those Rensets onto multiple members, that will be a big advantage for IG if they want to keep fighting for Dragon, which you have to think is that big thing coming into this game. You would normally, but Dragon up in a minute 20, and Kalista's gone top lane here up against Flandre's Nautilus, who has a double Doran's ring, by the way. So possibly a rod of Aiders, but definitely needs some early AP and health and the regen for the early landing. I mean, Kid maybe trying to get a couple of extra quick turrets here with the... Uh, attack speed, he has to know that he's going to at least try and push the wave when he feels like it, but that does leave that dragon open here. I mean, the big question is, will we see Snake go straight onto it? That's kind of the question we don't know. IG are just kind of hedging their bets and hoping, as you see, the huge burst damage come through from the explosive shot. They're just hoping that they can swap back in, say, two, three minutes' time and the dragon still be an objective con to contest. Yeah, very smart harass there by Crystal. That charge on the turret actually doubled in radius uh, when it explodes on the turret as well, which is why the two people that were down there trying to defend ended up eating so much AoE damage. But Crystal is going to come in, looks to try and take the turret away. 30 seconds left to Dragon, should be able to get both maybe. It just feels like IG in general a bit unsettled by this Tristana pick. It hasn't been seen much in competitive play, although Uzi playing it showed that a lot of teams are considering this as a viable pick. The turret pushing and the harass under turret makes it so hard for an underleveled Hecarim to even hug the turret for any hope of picking up experience because you get punished by that AoE damage and have to back away. So it maybe it'll evolve as a way to deal with zoning these underleveled 1v2 specialists because you just have to respect that explosion damage. And good timing here by Snake as well. I know they have time to wait for the dragon. Do take the turret away, but Beast and Baka were already on top of it. Flander has actually walked down here as well. And of course the bottom turret's gone down. So one for one in turrets. Dragon almost done here at this stage of the game. And IG going to give up any hopes of potential contesting and go for a push instead. Yes, the tie isn't even level six. They really don't want to fight. He doesn't even have teleport if they wanted to. But smart to go for a bit of turret damage. Again, in fact, a lot of turret damage through. Almost dead there. Flandre looks to get in range for the ulti, but doesn't quite get there. And Cassidy kind of hard to pin down as well. Snake now five man strong in the mid lane, though. Maybe look for an initiation, but instead could look again. They've got a turret already. Maybe just push in for a siege. And one of the reasons that IG lost that previous game is they fought for dragons. They weren't really in any position to with their comp, with their item timings. Smart of IG not to try and do that in this situation, but you can see the punishment coming through. Happy to tank a couple of turret shots, because the siege is on. Yeah, that's aggressive from Crystal, just using the shield from Ella to deal damage to the turret, but Explosive shot down. Tristana, still a pretty good siege champion, arguably better with the changes that have come through recently on this patch, and Snake are not giving up, at least for now. I mean, it's not a lot of wave care coming through from IG, you have to mention. It's Kakao is honestly the biggest wave clearer there. As Rookie's starting to get a bit of AP behind, no Rod of Ages stacking just yet. Does have the gold for it, though, and that's a 10-minute window to tell you when IG are really looking to opt in to fight. Yeah, rookie going to get that item, does complete the Rod of Ages and will power up quite nicely in the next 10 minutes time. Kid, Hurricane almost done there as well. Maybe he just needs it for wave clear, honestly, at this point. 
potentially expecting a lot of siege coming through for Crystal, who's now picked himself up an Avarice Blade, curiously enough. So going for a bit more of that greed, a bit more of the investment option there. Maybe he just looks over to the fact that there are multiple members, the likes of Cassidy, and they're really looking to stack up to the late game. Cinderhawk's effectively a death cap for health and incentivizes further health purchases. At least the Phage, of course, going to come through for Zatai. The Rod of Ages has a 10-minute stacking time. Callista is looking for immediate power, but because the team in general is tending towards the late game in terms of their item pickups, why not go for Avarice Blade and do your best uh, kid impression when it comes to investment banking on these AD carries? Yeah, Hurricane completed now for kid, actually, so... Going to get quite a bit better at chopping down these minions. Those rookie level 9 as well. Going to push it on the turret, but Ella's there to help him out. And has to be a bit careful, Jana. Level 6 here, Kitties will come in as well. And that should force the Jana off the turret and gift it over to IG. But you just very seldomly see a Kassan and get an enemy's turret first, let alone an Azir, the king of 25, 30 minutes. Ada turret's still up because he has so much wave clear. Great decision by IG to give up any hopes of contesting just the first dragon for that inner turret damage. So the outer turret damage in mid, because it's definitely opened up this map a bit. I mean, Rookie forced the roof walk away, though. Ella and Crystal willing to fight there, and Rookie not weak at this point of the game, does have his Rod of Ages, but that's still charging up here, and Rookie maybe have to think twice about going in for an aggressive 1v2. Speaking of aggression, three members up the top lane. Fondre already super tanky and has a very good idea that there's foes afoot. Yeah, he's actually behind in gold and CS as well. You have to, ex or CS and gold you have to expect there. Only 10 though, Flunder's actually kept up quite nicely in the early situation. And we see this a lot from Flunder's. You see he's got about 1,200 gold to spend there. And, uh, almost 1,000 gold behind actually. So about 800, 900 gold down is a bit tricky for Flunder. But I have to say for someone who was kind of sold to us at the start of the season as a carry top laner, he spends an awful lot of his games with little to no gold. I think this is just what he's developed and, and understanding what beast and Ella have brought the lineup and the consistent uh, overriding identity of Crystal as a hyper carry player. It was always the Tristanas and Cogmores of the world that really fit Crystal's playstyle. So someone has to lose the gold. It's one of the reasons that OMG have really struggled to come together is that it feels like for them, Loveland has been the one to, to lose out on gold, but he's still very stubborn in his playstyle, getting in the enemy's face. Not really good counter jungling when you're, what, 1,000, 1,500 gold worth of items effectively down on what you used to be. In this situation, Crystal's always the one that picks up the farm, so that's why we see Righteous Glory Nautilus coming through, is that he's very got a very low uh, floor when it comes to, da to team fight stats. Just needs the Righteous Glory to get that CC going. Bit of poke on to Kikau, actually. Going to get some AoE down. Does actually hit onto the turret, I think, as well. So Snake again, good seed here with the Tristana. Dragon, not quite available yet, would be... I guess breaking serve in a sense, they're on the Dragons, give either team their second if they picked it up and it's back up in two minutes and Snake more than happy to do a little bit of ARAM here. I mean, IG really want to have Cassidy and Hecarim as the 1-3-1 unit, but their remaining three players have little to no wave player, even with the Hurricane. That's probably why we saw the Hurricane Rush, was to open up these situations where you can just hoover down minion waves with Callista, but it's going to take a lot of autos without the AD pickups, and so far it's been picked apart, although Hecarim picking up items is always a good thing yes, for IG. Tai should be able to take that turret. In fact, Flandre is getting tracked by Kakao in his own jungle, walks past a ward as well, and Zatai might just fancy a kill here, but that tower should be going over as a result, but again, Dragon up in a minute 20. I do have to be careful not to be caught out of position when the objective respawns. And look, realistically, even though this is an under-farmed, under-items completed Flandre, you are not going to kill a Nautilus. Nautilus, one of the reasons why he's so popular in the support role is he does so much with so little. Having that scaling cooldown reduction on Riptide gives him wave clear and just lots of teamfight impact even after his targeted CC, the depth charges down. So just happy to build up items because in the late game, in a different way, Hecarim's going to be very relevant just with a much higher item cap. Yeah, rookie with the blue buff now as well. Dragon back up in 50 seconds. So everybody going back to shop. Crystal has a static shift, curiously. So going quite old school with this Tristana build here. I mean, that makes sense, right? We've already said they want to 1-3-1. They want to buy time in the middle. Stop any of this split pushing nonsense with just really fast pushing of your own. It's Crystal's approach to taking out this game between the maxed out explosive charge and the auto attacks. You're just going to be mowing down minion waves yourself. You do not want to get into a situation where IG are able to max it, like pull out this game to the late enough stage with no cost. You want to make sure they're losing objectives consistently. So even when they get those late game items, they're one fight away from just losing the game outright. If they're able to just side farm and Hecarim shows up with a Trinity Force and tanky items and Snake don't have a clear win condition, they will lose this game because the scaling from Kassan and Hecarim, it's near infinite. It is. I mean, Tristana still scales quite well. Probably been toned down a bit as Kakao 
Takes a bit of damage there from the Trist. We'll explode there as well. But it's just buying time for people to farm. Yeah, pretty tanky. And they just want the Dragon here. Flandre's rotating down to Ty. Does have his Teleport available, though. Home Guard not there, but does have his Skirmishes Sabre. And Snake going to pull the Dragon out quite far away. But Zatai, stubborn in his ways here, sticking in the top lane. And honestly, this is just a bluff. They just want to buy as much time for Snake off this objective. They don't really want to Teleport, but they're going to try it. Well, they are going to Teleport, actually, there as... Dragon gets about half out. Kitty so dives in with the ulti. Beats gonna get stunned up, but he's fairly tanky. Good knockback there for Cap. Oh and a boy. massive ult from Zatai. Now Crystal forced to run away. Flandre has to get out as well, but Rookie diving into the back lines with re reckless abandon. Beast will go down as well. That's gonna be an ace completed as Flandre goes down. And Invictus Gaming single handedly win the team fight. And look, I was the one bluffed, Patreon, because the damage coming through was insane from Rookie, especially, even with just a fiendish codex. The burst was registered, and the hurricane came up trumps. They were already spreading damage. The burst flew from just a tie with no big damage items. I thought they were just looking for a situation where they just keep split pushing by time and ensure the items came through, but clearly they can opt into team fights just happily. Yeah, they were comfortable there. I mean, Crystal's still getting bigger, Baka there as well. And they have so many good tools in a disorganized fight like that that as soon as it happens, Someone cleans house, and that's Cassidy. I thought they were a couple of items away from starting this fight. Firstly, Ella uses the monsoon after the CC effects have come, but just watch this engage coming through, and just the stacked up rampage damage from Zatai gets everyone low, and everyone's low against Cassidy and Callista. You can fill in the blanks. It's choose your own adventure for who picks up the kill from IG, and just really smart team fighting and layering of CC. Good disengage there by Kitties. Uh, engage, sorry, by Kitties here as well, with the support cannon being chucked in there by the Callista. You can kind of see why it's been such a popular combination here and look at that gold leader already IG suddenly 7-1 up in kills with about 5,500 gold ahead yeah ask me anything about a Hecarim Cassidy lineup 6,000 gold ahead and winning in objectives things are looking excellent here for Invictus Gaming and it's kind of back to form for the first two games you have to think Snake were able to wrest control of game three and just take it over in a few quick fights but IG now in that position as Beast will spot the tie here but devastating charge away Baka trying oh. to get him with the ulti but just misses. That wall, I mean, that rift apparently was just slightly too thick for him to be able to stop, to hold up the whole objective. So they don't even get the pick. Devastating Charge was enough to break away from Beast, enough that it wasn't instantly interrupted by the model size of Rek'Sai. And Zatai gets to get a free minion. And look at Zatai's tower there just poking out of the bottom half of the screen. It's basically on full health. There's a tie. Gonna fight Barker now as well, but Flandre is gonna join in. Barker actually getting quite low here. There's a tie. Uses the ulti. Gonna keep chasing in. Flandre gonna try and CC him up, but Kakao's diving in as well. Barker comes through. He gets moved away by the explosive cast. Flandre now, the target actually getting chased down. Is low gonna go down? The tie gets the kill and IG pick up the double. And at the same time in the bottom lane, they actually take out a turret as well. Casting roaming around happily in the midst of all this. Not even needed. Now looking for the assassination on Ella. Yeah, rookie. Gonna keep chasing in Ella. Nowhere good to run up. Oh, base gates will protect him for a while. Rift walk. On a short ish cooldown, I'll say at level 11, so not quite available back again. Invictus Gaming in a push on the top side as well. And all of a sudden, 90 minutes in, and IG looking complete control once I, more. I did not expect, with the item timings completed, for Nautilus look like a complete wet noodle compared to the. The Hecarim, but Hecarim overtook that big dragon fight. He's now split pushing, going for the Frozen Heart, not rushing into any sort of damage items. And Nautilus with Righteous Glory and 56 CS behind. I don't know what they were thinking with this Nautilus pick, but it's certainly not worked yet. Not right now as B's going to try and knock up Kitties. Does get it, but the Fates Call will get him out to safety. And a futile attempt there for Snake does not net a kill. And Kassin just roaming around. 10 stack wide of ages, just about a minute away from completion. And the next item, whatever he's looking for, is going to be a big one. I mean, already Rookie's doing ridiculous damage on the Kassin. And so probably as on is coming through, does have the... Uh, Fiendish Codex for the Chalice that will eventually come through as well. I've seen uh, Godby actually from LGD again waiting in the final there tomorrow. Really popularized this particular 5.6, 5.7 cast at him. This is what you need to do. Power down turrets. That's what Snake are best at. You have good disengage as well. And Cassidy, you can see, was off screen thinking about his options, wasn't able to do anything. Snake grouping and sieging is their best way to win, even if there are ultimates like the explosive cask and to some degree the slicing maelstrom and hecarim ult that you have to respect. Just ward your flank ensure that you're not flanked by either the Kassin or the Hecarim and keep pushing because at the moment that's all you can do with this line. I mean we've seen what happens to Snake when they fight Invictus Gaming in any sort of jungle or choke again. Disorganized fights that's 
the best possible news for Kassan and Hecarim. Even Callisto, who's highly mobile, loves those sort of fights as well. Chaotic skirmishes almost is what they want, where Snake looking for big 5v5 team fights. And the thing is, between Gragas and Hecarim, you have a Terrify and a huge displacement. It's the sort of fight that's always going to be, by, necess by necessity, disorganized because positioning's at a premium between those two abilities. One forces you in a, in, a, in a particular direction. The other one completely displaces you. And that's just so much carnage for the uh, Kalista to hop around with the defensive utility of the Slicing Maelstrom. There's actually a very smart team comp coming through from IG. And if they don't take advantage of their one big point of power, which for Snake is pushing and the lack of wave clear on IG, team fights are so hard for them to navigate. Yeah, Rookie is, you already kind of said it, but Kassadin gets untenable in the late game. He might already be at this position as he is going to go back, spend a big boatload of cash there as well. And I wonder what item he's going to pick up as Baka sets up a sun turret. Actually not quite going for big ticket items just yet as Rookie cooldown boots and working in towards, I think, a chalice there with a Fiendish Codex and an Aptom. It's going to be Zonia's and Athene's at some point. Just, you know, putting items together can always change the build. Could be an emergency void stuff if you really want it, but just getting as much power as possible. Moving towards 40% CDR. Has the large mana pool, but not necessarily the mana regen, but, you know, picking up blue at this point, probably not going to be a big concern right now. No, and it's just the big resets there with the mana refresh constantly coming through with the Athene's. It makes Kastrin real scary in the late game situations. And Cannon's looking to match the Righteous Glory. Of course, feels a little bit silly with all the mana in his inventory right now, but of course, when you finish that Righteous Glory, it just really helps you have the effective engage or just the Righteous Glory for the u defensive utility. Offensively or defensively, we send one offensive use of the Slicing Maelstrom. You'd expect with the Janna, though, purely going to be appealing to for kid and fights. Yeah, just nice to have another way to get in or out, given that Fate's Call is going to give you one already. And again, that's been the reason we've seen Cannon support be so popular recently. I mean, Snake are working on, again, their best thing, which is the Siege, but the tie may be enough here as Kitties is also in the area. Kakao even wandering his way back up, and Snake, they spot the Cassidy, and they run straight back to their turrets. And their big issue is they need to five-man group to get the biggest value out of their comp and all the synergies and disengage they have. But, you know, you put five men top, that opens up a whole map of opportunity for IG to try different things, whether it's split pushing with Zatai, whether it's trying to take the dragon that spawns in a few seconds. There's always an opportunity cost to your rotations. And five man top is seldom seen because it's just really not effective. And you can see Baka going to go back now. Has to spend a bit more gold and move in towards what looks to be a death cap. Zatai actually fancies Crystal. That's big burst damage coming through, but Zatai also quite tanky with the Frozen Heart. Ella will flash ulti to move him back. Flandre is even here as well, but Crystal getting aggressed on here. Zatai might get a kill. 1v3 goes in. Massive burst. The ulti goes just wide there. Fandre hooks him up again and Crystal finally gets the kill but IG they advance it with a dragon. Exactly. The best they could hope is one kill for a dragon. It's on the other side of the map. That's of course what we're talking about in terms of trade-offs. A kill gets Tristana going to some degree, but it's the absolute minimum you can get. And the minion waves, again, completely in the control of IG. Yeah, kids even solo pushing down the bottom side well, no there words. as well. Yeah, it doesn't need them. I mean, has his friends on the other side of the map anyway. Knows the ties drawing pressure. And this hacker room is pretty tanky. He's doing decent damage, I have to say, to Crystal in these exchanges. But even without a Trinity Force, the tie is so annoying. Exactly. And he's just going to keep going top. Now he's super tanky. Doesn't really do a lot of damage, but enough to actually chunk out Crystal, as we could see. Not enough to force his heal, but certainly really make positioning difficult for the Tristana. Blade the Ruin King is the actual adaptation for Kid. We've seen this a couple of places in different scenes, not so much in the LPL. He definitely doesn't have the defensive shield. It is a little bit more prone to being assassinated, although it seems so far that only Nautilus really can get onto that backline at this point with the death charge. If he's able to just not be burst down, and honestly, it's very difficult for Snake to burst down a single target. The consistent damage of the Blade of the Ruin King adds up, and it's being spread over with the armor penetration and the hurricane being completed. Yeah, so Kid, three items looking strong. Crystal working in for his Bloodthirster here, you have to think, with that Vampiric set, it doesn't even have boots too yet on the Triss, so a bit of thrift shopping now, about 20 CS behind, actually, over on that over on uh, Kid, sorry. Rookie looking down, has completed his zone. He's going to work in for that chalice. You have to think of that next item in Kakao. Getting tanky, he's got his locket already done. Here's a tie, of course. Doing his usual thing and pushing down bottom lane. Not interested in grouping whatsoever. Obviously would really love a Trinity Force at this point, but had to go for tankiness. Yeah, honestly, he's got so much damage from Gragas and Callista. Well, sorry, from Cassidy and Callista, so doesn't really need to worry about focusing on damage. And now that they spot Nautilus bottom, 
Baron started. I mean, Zatai's going to force a very poor choice here for Snake one way or the other. Beast not quite in the area as Flunder is already porting into Zatai, though. Will port in to join them, and they're going to start a team fight here. Rookie looking for someone. Kakao, massive ulti. Moves Baka back in. He gets them out with his ultimate, though, and Kitties can't quite find a way in. But Zatai in the middle of everyone. So tanky and disruptive, and no one dead quite yet, but it's only a matter of time. Zatai charging in, finds Baka, does get the kill despite the turret going up. Off in the back line. Kitties takes out Crystal. Flunder is getting dope now as well. Ella's already dead. It's maybe going to be a fourth kill. Zatai will chase in for it, will take it away. And another clean team fight for Invictus Gaming. They're looking for the clean ace, though. Only Rek'Sai alive, but Zatai's there. Yeah, Beast can't do anything. Rookie will chase in as Zatai gets a well-earned double kill. He doesn't have the burst damage, but it's so tanky and sticky that it doesn't really matter. IG can push some turrets, or they can take the Baron, and they're going to pick the Baron, it seems. Might even be able to do both at this particular stage, where the death time is are quite low, to be perfectly honest here. Only 26 and a half minutes. It's in, but that Baron is dead, and IG up in turrets, well up in kills, and up in dragons. You look up at that gold thing, you see maybe a sinking feeling in your heart if you're a snake fan, because that is 11,000 gold behind. And amusingly, it's a complete role reversal from the previous game, 14 to 2, very similar to the 15 to 1 score. We saw Snake win the previous game. The rotations have been decent from Snake, only a, a turret behind, although not going so well on the dragon front. But the kills just aren't there whatsoever. And the Chitano did so much work in the previous game, is forced into an emergency bilge water. If we learned anything in this series, buying a bilge water is bad times for an AD carry. Yeah, not, at least for Crystal, uh, as far as things are concerned, because Kid, of course, did buy his analysis blade of the wrong game. Okay, the bilge water, though, when it's in the inventory by sure. itself, it seems to be the sign that you're going to lose a fight. It's very lonely here as far as lifestyle items go. I mean, especially for Crystal, much more of a defensive item. And sure, he needs peel sometimes, he needs to stay alive, but he's, you know, that big bloodthirst to jump on top of the enemy with my rocket jump and flash sort of AD carry, you know, very imp-esque almost in that way. So you have to think, when you see Crystal in particular with a defensive item like Blade of the Ruin King, it's just not the same AD carry. And honestly, I think it's to some degree it's his prioritization of slot efficiency. As you can see, I don't think he's actually damaging Zatai. No, Zatai is really tanky at this stage of the game. He's got a Spirit Vizard, he's got his Frozen Heart, he's got about 3k health with his Cinderhawk. Even got a Phage just for a few more offensive options. And again, he's been annoying all game. He might even solo Crystal here, even with Beast watching. I mean, Satai gives no Mundos at this point. No, he time. does not. Absolutely zero here as IG going to split push up with the Baron up minions, push down the mid, rotate to the top, and just leaves the tie to his own devices. Even if he dies, IG will be able to pick up a couple turrets in top. Tier 2 is well and truly dead already. And that's the thing. Tristana can't even hope to solo. I mean, when her ult's down, there's considerable kill pressure. She's already used it defensively, and that just opens up this four-man group at top to push. Yeah, rookie tanks a couple turrets. Barker actually going to be launched back into the team. Ella denies him there as Barker doesn't quite throw out his ult. He will hold on to it with the Monsoon but IG going to take out the turret. Kitty's getting low, actually gets face called at just the last second. They take the inhibitor turret. Bucky getting jumped on. Ulti's, but he's already dead. Kid's still jumping in. Ren comes down for a second kill. And now Crystal being chased down. Rookie just going in into tie. Ult's on to Crystal. Tristana's dead. Ella will die soon as well, as Rookie might look for it. But honestly, IG, they don't even need it. They'll look for the kill. Ella will get away, but that's three clean kills. Never mind, Kitty's died as well. But the base completely shattered now. As the tie shows you the value of the full tank Hecarim doing so much work regardless despite the fact that that's the series the surrender still comes out from Snake and although it's just for third place I think the IG fans are certainly going to go home happy as three out of four games they looked really on form they look good and you, you can tell Snake a team that when they win look great they've got a lot of good strength to the team but we've kind of seen this a lot in the latter end of the season I think this series is similar have very exploitable tendencies to Snake and be interested to see as they finish their season. Fourth place, not too shabby uh, in playoffs, of course. Second overall in the standings for the regular season. When they show up again next bit, I wonder what they'll look like then. And they just have to work on different game plans, you have to think. When they had the ranged initiation, that was something we hadn't seen much from Snake. The Swajwani looked good, but now you move Beast back onto an early ganking champion like the Rek'Sai. Certainly was nowhere near the same tier of players that we saw when Kakao moved onto the Rek'Sai. 0-4-1, basically completely anonymous this game. Okay, there weren't many kills to go around. That's one out of three kill participation. But IG, they see, you can see some wry smiles on their face. Honestly, they wish they were in a game tomorrow for the finals of course third place is still a very respectable result for a lineup that came up super late as Kakao and Rookie joined this team just before the deadline as the season started they've got a lot to improve on but they still have a very solid foundation and I feel like we still don't know the answer pastry time what is IG all about what is their play style because it changes so regularly but when they can adapt 
and then basically play Snake's game plan and beat them at it, it really bodes well for the future. It does, and it's going to be a great LPL second sweep. But of course, before that, we have a grand final to play tomorrow, would you believe? Two pretty decent teams maybe going head to head tomorrow. LGD versus EDG. That's going to be quite a final. And the hype is all over the place. Imp versus Death, the battle of the Samsung AD carries. A throw Acorn in there as well. I think a guy named Porn might be there. We're not 100% sure, but he seems to play all the time despite his sicknesses. It's going to be a sick final, and you guys have to tune Yeah, in. that'll be at 4 p.m. tomorrow, local time. That's Australian Eastern Daylight Time. So Usual LPL yeah, time. Yeah, so adjust your time zone, of course, as you move in, but that'll be quite the final. Of course, there's more coming through as well. Stay on this stream in about an hour and a half. You can't get any more League of Legends, and I couldn't blame you if you couldn't. The International Wildcard Invitational Grand Final will be here as well, hosted by Atlas and Spawn. And that is Besiktas from Turkey, the hometown team, up against the Brazilians, INTZ. I mean, INTZ, they're going to come up big favorites, but still, Besiktas, they came back from what was a very difficult start for them, and hopefully it will be a competitive five-game we'll, series. We'll have to see. It's going to be lots of competitive five-game series, and we end one today as well. Congratulations to IG for finishing third. Snake, of course, will take their fourth in the playoffs. But join us tomorrow for the grand final for the LPL. Join us later as well, not us, but join Allison Spawn for the IWCR grand final as well. With myself, Papa Smithy, and our entire live production crew, we'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. local time for the LPL grand final.